Mina, Kondanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Finally here. Uh, for, uh, Thursday past midnight, so generally it's Friday. Finally coming at you with the Sunday sermon, which should have been there last Sunday. So, yeah. Timeliness, by far not my strongest point. It's a horrible thing that I am desperately trying to learn how to control. Please forgive me. I've been playing way too many Dark Souls lately, and it's been fun. And this is about Jesus, not Dark Souls. So I'm going to move along from there. Not that I have any problem talking about video games in a preaching video, just that's not... Dark, I'm not really drawing any resurrection analogies from Dark Souls, so it really doesn't have much of a place here except for an explanation as to where my time is gone. So, Robbie, you'll never see this because you don't like preaching or Christianity very much, but if you ever, ever do, just know that you got me into a horrible, horrible addiction, which I love you for. Tonight's topic is something very near and dear to my heart that reading about Elijah and his story has really like just brought to me and that's the topic of revival we hear a lot about revival in the church okay maybe we don't hear a lot about it and we don't because there's not a whole lot of it but how many of you when you think of revival you think of going to a tent message or or a series of tent messages you, you think of a tent um, on some open field or in a parking lot somewhere and you think about a series of evangelists, some of them probably missionaries from other countries, some of them relatively well-known, at least within your denomination. Maybe not some international thing like Billy Graham, but you know, just, uh, just someone within your denomination, someone fairly beloved by your set of people, so to speak. And even us non-denominational guys, we have people that travel around in our circles and we're just like, oh yeah, that dude, that dude that did the thing, he's awesome. It'd be great to hear him speak. Oh, he's coming to speak at this revival. We're going to go and see that. It's going to be amazing. Maybe God will break out and do some miracles. It's going to be the best. Or maybe you just think of that week-long revival in your church. It's not necessarily outside, maybe not a bunch of guest speakers. It's just really a chance for you and your church to get together, have a good time, maybe have a meal ahead of time. I know uh, I personally was saved in a Southern Baptist church, so initially when I heard the term revival, I just thought about those week-long meetings where you went to church every night. Uh, some nights I'd rather be playing video games, but Jesus is more important, so I went to church. And there may or may not have been a guest speaker. A lot of, uh, there really, there wasn't a choir called out of town. It was our choir director and our choir. They put in several extra hours so that we could all, excuse me, enjoy just the, the worship and the songs that they put together. They, they probably busted out a few new songs that we weren't normally used to because it's revival time. We got to do something new. We got to do something fresh. And actually, you now that I think about it, usually... Usually they'd have like at least one or two speakers. It may not have been a different speaker every night like with those tent things, but there was usually a, and probably some tent things, it was pro, pro, I'm guessing the like evangelists back in the day also had, I have 30 minutes, but I know 30 minutes goes by quick, but I should have some time to talk about a few rambly things. I'm pretty sure that evangelists back in the day, it wasn't hosted by a church, it was hosted by the evangelists. So the evangelist, it wouldn't be a revival associated with your church, so much as it would be associated with a revival ministry, an evangelist ministry, and it would be an evangelist from just somewhere in the United States, or maybe usually somewhere in the United States. Usually they're missionaries. They go around the world. Maybe someone from somewhere else in the world, and they would pop their tent somewhere. They'd go to ch some church somewhere, and then they'd speak for a week or two, and that would be revival. Whereas with the older... Uh, the, the, the classic Baptist churches, they would usually have their, their own pastor. They would speak for some, uh, several days and maybe one guest pastor, maybe two. I think usually just one from my, my personal experience. They would speak and it would be kind of a trade-off, like one night would be one, one night would be the other, one night would be one, one night would be the other. And the one thing that characterized all of these revival things was at the end of the night, there would be a gospel presentation and an invitation for people to come forward and accept Christ. A lot of people would come forward. Usually within a few months, they'd be gone. And that was something that the churches did every single year. It was an annual occurrence. And if you were in association with a ministry or that um, did a lot of mission stuff or maybe 
a bigger church, so you had access to more funds. You might have revival two or three times a year. And then I got to digging around in history a little bit. So that's what I grew up knowing revival as. Got to digging around in history, American history specifically. And apparently, revival can mean something a whole lot more. Apparently, there have been two great awakenings in the United States. And these great awakenings, it wasn't something that just lasted for a week or even a month. It usually would be around a particular minister. Usually it'd be in, it would be in regards to one minister, not necessarily a church. Usually this minister would end up planting several churches. But we're at, like, and sometimes, sometimes it was localized to an area. But at these times, there was this great awakening where several people would come to the Lord and the meetings would be pretty chaotic, lots of shouting, lots of singing, some kind of crazy stuff would happen like people would you know be slain in the spirit rolling around on the floor praying in tongues and like a whole lot of people would come to the lord and these people really wouldn't leave christianity they'd be like churchgoers and quote unquote good people for the rest of their lives and the uh, this has happened twice just google this it's happened twice in american history i forget the names of the preachers that it was centered around like the people who spearheaded these movements. I for I pre no, I'm pretty sure it wasn't like a localized thing, like it was in this one county or this one state. I don't know why this nose is itching me so much, this particular nostril right now. Ugh. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't lo just it was more about one person who traveled and not one location. And wherever this person went, there would be revival. And sometimes someone else close to him. I don't know why I'm yawning so much and my nose is itching so much. This is really annoying. And I really want to give this message to you guys. So please forgive the yawning and forgive the uh, occasional nose scratching. This message is going out because I think it's important. And wherever these people would go, they would get some disciples. And then those disciples would generally like catch, I guess, the fire. And then they would spread revival. And then they would be the local centers and the local churches where it would just be this massive boom of Christianity and lots and lots of people becoming Christians at that time. And apparently there have been things in the contemporary day and age of similar thing. We um, There was the Toronto Blessing. There was the Brownsville Revival. Um, oh, what else was there? And then there's Tommy Tenney with the God Chasers. That was a thing about a decade or so ago. And all these things are kind of, they weren't on the scale of the, great, the two great awakenings in the past, but they were, I think, much more closely connected to the biblical definition of revival than just the traditional revival that's held every single year. I actually had a Christian brother of mine talk to me about that recently, and I was like, and he talked about those yearly things that they did where they had a guest speaker come in, and I was like, dude... If you want to talk about revival, um, can we talk about not just the thing you do at church once a year, but actual revival? He didn't seem overly offended, but I could tell I'd stepped on his toes a little bit because I was kind of putting down what his church was doing at the time. And honestly, I was. And I'm putting down what the traditional churches do, the church where I got saved, what it did. I, I kind of hope it still at least does it because at least then it's trying. But we humans don't schedule revival. The first biblical revival is going to be in Acts chapter 2, where Peter preaches and 3,000 people get saved. That is the first <sighs> biblical revival that is mentioned, where just a ton of people come to the Lord. Well, maybe not the first. There's that story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the giant sacrifice that Elijah called down fire from heaven for and then had the 450 prophets of Baal killed afterwards. And the hearts of Israel were turned back to God. Well, at least temporarily since Jezebel then threatened him and he ran away, even though he called fire out of heaven. I already discussed in a previous message this week how that's a little bit crazy, but men of God, we can be very weak too. We're still 
you know, we still live in this flesh body. We still have a sin nature. We're susceptible to falling. We're, we have our weaknesses. We give in to temptations. We sin. We're far from perfect. You, I think you could possibly call that a revival. I don't know how long lasted it was. I don't know if Baal, if uh, like Baal worshippers just quickly went back from worshiping God to Baal. I should say the Israelites. How quickly the Israelites went from worshiping Baal. They went back to God at least after God sent down fire from heaven. When Elijah ran away and Jezebel came back. I don't know if, uh, and now my eyes starting to irritate me. This is great. This is the best. I don't know if, I'm going to preach, I'm going to keep talking anyway. I don't know if Israel immediately went back to worshiping Baal when Elijah walked away from God. But, I do know that there was a giant turning back to God at that time after seeing a miracle of that nature. And I want to see stuff like that happen in our day and age. I want to see biblical revival happen in this day and time. And another key note about revivals, uh, the two great awakenings in the past, um, all the, the littler, littler, that's a word now, it is as of right now, the Little Earth Revivals, the Toronto Blessing, the Brownsville Revival, the Tommy Tinney God Chasers thing, the Book of Acts, and Elijah. One thing that all, this is the best message ever with all these little distractions, but I'm going to make it through anyway, and God bless you if you're sticking with me. One thing that all of these messages had in common was there were miracles. There was a very tangible knowledge of the presence of God in a more physical way, in a more direct way that humans could grasp a hold of. Like when God showed up, he showed up big time. I actually just read today, going back to Elijah, where Elijah, this is after Ahab's death, and this is in the days of his son Ahaziah, king of Israel. Let me just read this. To set it up, Ahaziah fell through a lattice in his upper room in Samaria. He was injured. He wanted to, he wanted to inquire of Baalzebub. And yes, that is Beelzebub. That actually was a god that was worshipped back in the day. I'm going to keep on going. And so he's like, go and inquire of that god to see if I'll recover. And so the Holy Spirit whispers to Elijah, hey, go and let those messengers that he's sending to this god of Ekron know uh, is it for lack of there being a God in Israel that you're inquiring of Beelzebub in Akron? You're going to die because you have not come to me. So, the messengers immediately come back and they're like, hey, is, he, the king's like, why are you back so quickly? And they're like, well, we met someone along the way and this is what he said. And apparently he says in the name of the God of Israel you're going to die. And I love this. This is just fine to me. Then he said to them, this is verse 7, 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 7. Then he said to them, what kind of man was it who came up to you, came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. A hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. Why is it these prophets of God are hairy men that live in the wilderness? Why is that a thing? I don't quite get it. Is my man of God lacking because I'm relatively smooth and because I live in an actual home? Am I lacking in anointing and power? Well, compared to these guys, I honestly am. But yeah, so being, uh, being the offended, triggered king that he was in verse 9, then the king sent him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him, and there he was sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, Man of God, the king has said, Come down. So Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. That old fire coming down from heaven thing? Yeah, it's not limited to just sacrifice. Uh, Elijah torched those men who were coming to arrest him, kill him, beat him. Who knows? That fire from heaven thing uh, happened again, and it happened a second time. And then the third captain of 50 came and humbled himself to Elijah, and then he went to the king directly and just reiterated the same prophecy that he just said. And this is what James has to say in regards to Elijah. And I'm not just going to read the one part about Elijah. I want to read... 
the parts right before that as well because it's really important as far as moving in the Spirit of God and us moving in the power of God. Because Elijah's mentioned... Excuse me. Elijah is mentioned in context of his power, in context of miracles. James chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and that healing that healing doesn't just cover the physical you know it talks about confessing your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed that healing transcends the physical which was talked about at first it's a part of it but it transcends that when there's confession of sin then there's an inner healing there's a change on the inside and we're healed from the inside out the physical healing as important as that is and as much as we desire it there's a deeper healing that the Lord wishes to do in us and then, Eli verse 17, James 5, 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's a sinful nature, just to let you know. And remember the whole thing where he ran away from Jezebel? I mentioned it just a few days ago. You can catch that message if you want to. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. Elijah was a guy just like us. And when he prayed, heaven stood still and heaven moved. Like the literal heavens above us. And that's something we have access to in the name of the Lord. This has to do with revival again because revival, when you think of revival, when you look at it historically, when you look at it biblically, Miracles are involved. The hand of God is involved. You want to talk about revival? That is a time when the Spirit of God comes in a powerful way and God's moving in the earth is obvious. That's revival. It's not a yearly meeting. It's not a tent meeting. And it's certainly not some quack, you know, telling people that he's paid. You know, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to lay hands on you and you're going to stand up from the wheelchair and people are going to believe and it's going to be great and we're all going to make a lot of money. That's some fraudulent stuff does go on. And I wish it didn't, but false prophets and false teachers, they're going to be a thing until the end of this world. As long as humans ha are sinners, and as long as humans are crooks, those things are going to happen. And we've simply, we've got to understand and believe that in the middle of all that crookedness, God moves too. God's real too. Some of this stuff is legit. Not just back then. Some stuff nowadays is legit as well. And yes, so you look at... The, some of the movements that I talked about, and you look at some of the men involved, and you look at historically some of the men involved in revivals in the past, you will see a lot of failure. A lot of failure. I'm going to mention a name specifically because it has to do with the Toronto Blessing, a man that was involved in that. Uh, his name is Todd Bentley. He got a divorce, and he got remarried, and that... It was a big part, that was a big hit on that particular revival. There was a man in some revival back in the day where I, and I didn't look into this prior to the video, so this is, I'm shooting from the hip here, forgive me if I miss by a little bit. Basically, he was ministering and he was seeking God and he, the revival came and the Spirit of God came. Miracles happened, people were healed, people were saved and came to the Lord and became Christians. And then eventually, that revival fell apart. He walked away for several years at, um, at the counsel of a friend of his who basically just said, you kind of need to back away from this, you need to take your hands off of it, and he did. And that revival fire just kind of died down. And again, none of this is, none of this is new. There's nothing new under the sun. Elijah, he... He prays, fire comes down from heaven, Israel cries out the Lord is God, the prophets of Baal are killed, Jezebel threatens him, and he runs. Peter, who preached one day, and 3,000 came to the Lord, not only did he deny Christ prior to that, but after that, 
at some point, you read in the book of Galatians where Paul had to rebuke him because he was no longer sitting with the Gentiles that God had, God had instructed him. I want to say it's Acts chapter 7. I'm going to check on that real quick. And I got a new Bible, so I can't just flip to it quite as fast as I did in the old one. Acts chapter 7... Nope, I was wrong. That was not that was not where Peter saw that was not where Peter saw that he needed to talk to the Gentiles. No, that is going to be in Acts chapter 10, where Peter had a vision, she came down from heaven, he saw a bunch of unclean animals, he was hungry, God said, "Eat." He said, "No, Lord, I'm never gonna, I'm not going to eat unclean animals. Nothing unclean has ever touched my mouth." God said, "Don't let what the Lord has cleansed be called unclean to you." And then a messenger from the house of Cornelius comes to him, says, "Hey, this Gentile wants to know about God." And then he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. They all speak in tongues. He realizes, hey, the Gentiles can be saved too. And then, well, and then Paul is called as the apostle to the Gentiles. And then in the book of Galatians, Peter kind of goes back and away and kind of shelters himself away from the Gentiles and starts kind of just paying attention more to the Jewish believers and the Jewish customs. And Paul's like, why are you going back to that? What are you doing? And he, the entire book of Galatians, Paul had to refute this heresy that you had to keep the works of the law, part of Judaism, in order to be saved, the grace of Jesus Christ. And he, took, he devoted an entire book of the Bible to refuting that error, that the law had anything to do with the grace of God. And Peter himself was becoming part of that heresy, part of that problem for a time, after this great revival where 3,000 people were saved. We're all humans. We're all sinners. We all make mistakes. But God can use each and every one of us in, a, in an amazing and in a fantastic way. And if we will seek God, if we will, if we will confess our trespasses to one another to be healed, if we will become righteous men and pray fervently and effectively, it can avail much. Elijah, Peter, Todd Bentley... That dude from the Great... I'm not sure if he was part of the Great Awakening times. I know he, it was from back in those, in those days, during those times. Actually, now that I think about it, I think the guy I'm talking about wasn't in, wasn't in America. I think that was actually a separate revival. But it was still during that period in history, and it was still a revival movement. All these guys are sinners. All these guys have fallen. They're like us. They make mistakes too. They may look amazing and great and glorious and God's really using them, but deep down inside we're all sinful sacks of crap. Okay? We've all made mistakes. We all make mistakes. We will all make mistakes. And the good news is God can use each and every one of us just like he used Elijah. And another thing that I really, and I, this is the closing point that I'll close on. The biggest thing that all these revivals was about, well, I'm going to say it was the biggest thing. The reason all these miracles happened, the reason all of these healings happened, let me get a little bit closer to you guys, look a little bit more dead in the camera here. The reason all of these things occurred, all of these smaller miracles happened, yeah, being raised from the dead, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the lepers cleanse, all those are small miracles to sh point to a much greater miracle. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the miracle that all of us can be saved and go to heaven and have our sins forgiven. A, a merciful God poured out all of His wrath and all of His judgment on Himself, on His Son, Jesus Christ. That I said on Himself and on His Son because of the Trinity, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. There's a topic for another video of another time. But God poured out all of his wrath. And he received it on himself. So that we could be with him forever in heaven. So that our sins could be forgiven. That's the greatest miracle of all. And during these revivals, lots and lots of people come to become... They, they become Christians. They get saved. They were lost, now they're found. They were blind, now they see. Remember that old hymn? Have you heard that one before? So to all of my Christian brothers and sisters who watch this, 
one, thank you very much for watching this and giving me um, some of your time. I definitely appreciate that. Let's seek the Lord and see if each of us can't become a walking revival, that our prayers can't become effectual and fervent, coming from a righteous heart, so that we might all be Elijah's, Moses's, um, Stephen from the New Testament, even Todd Bentley's from nowadays. They've all made their mistakes. They've all done things wrong. And I don't know, I'm not going to say I understand everything that they did, or if I don't even know if it was all made right, or if everyone repented. I only know from bi biblically, I know what I see. Um, some of the modern day guys, I don't know their entire stories. I don't know if they ever came back and repented. I don't know if they're still serving God. I do know that at one point they did serve God. I know at one point they were used by God. And I do know that they have the same nature that we do, and we can similarly do get great things. So brothers and sisters, let's strive for that. Let's make that our goal and our focus. And for those of you who are not saved and watching this video, thank you so much for giving me your time and expressing interest in, um, in the Christian faith. This was really... This wasn't a topic. This was more of an in-house discussion. This was more or less addressed to Christians. And if you're watching this far in and you're this interested, I'm guessing that maybe you're interested in becoming a Christian yourself. Maybe you're feeling a tugging on your heart, a need for something a little bit more than what you've had up to this point. And to you, I just want to say, you can become one of us. You can become a Christian right now. We're nothing special. I just told you how we're all sinful sacks of crap how we've all made mistakes, and some people don't eat. I'm not saying those revivalists who made mistakes didn't come back. I certainly hope to God they did. But even if they never did, doesn't mean you can't be saved. Doesn't mean you're bound and determined to make those same mistakes. Doesn't mean I have to follow the mistakes of those that have been made in the past. Hopefully, I will look at them, look at the mistakes, learn from the mistakes, and I will basically learn how to dodge those bullets you know, around those obstacles. And save myself a lot of grief and pain in my life. If you want to become a Christian right now, just believe in your heart and express with your mouth that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And that he rose again three days later. And that you will make him your God, your Lord, and your Savior. And if you want a prayer to follow, pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross and you shed your blood so that my sins could be forgiven, that all my wrongdoings could be made right. And I believe you rose again three days later, guaranteeing me eternal life in heaven. Please right now forgive my sin, forgive my wrongdoing. Be my God, be my Lord, be my Savior. And thank you so much for hearing this prayer and making me one of your children right now. Amen. If you pray that in faith, that's all it takes. That's all that's needed to be a Christian. Nothing else is needed. That belief from the heart, that desire to be forgiven, and that desire to make Him your God, that's all you need. And if you did, welcome to the family. That is awesome. It is a pleasure and a joy and a privilege to have you with us. If I may encourage you, find a Bible, whether it's here or a, a, a digital one, my... You can find it online, the entire Bible, multiple versions, very easily and all for free. Read the Bible just a little bit every day and find a version you can read and understand. Don't read, I'm not saying you can't read the older ones, just make sure you understand what you're reading. There are understandable Bibles out there that are written in plain English. Find one of them, because if you want to know God and who He is and what's on His mind and heart, reading the Bible is going to be the best way for you to learn and find out and just come to understand what it means to hear his voice and get to know him. If I, could, if I could encourage you a little bit further, get a little bit of Christian music in your life. There's something about music that kind of permeates our souls and our minds. So finding some worship music, some music that reminds us of God, that praises him for what he's done for us, find it really helpful as far as just maintaining a good Christian mindset and um, keeping our minds focused on him. And also, Final encouragement, try to find a group of people that believe the same thing as you, that are also Christians, that have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Usually you'll find this group of people at a church, although some churches aren't so good. Just because you go to a church doesn't mean it's full of good people or people that really love God. 
unfortunately. So you do have to be careful. But find some people that do love God, that you're convinced, believe in Him like you do, that have Jesus as Lord and Savior, and just make friends with some of those people. Encourage yourself with those people. You know, hang out with them. Spend some time with them. Because when you spend time with people that are like-minded, it's a huge encouragement, and it kind of helps you stay on the path, and it helps you learn and grow and continue this new walk that you're now on. And once again, congratulations on that. That is amazing and awesome. And to everyone out there, thank you so much for watching this video. If you've made it this far, just thank you so much. I, I, hopefully, if you watched this far, that I didn't administer to you in some way and it helped you. And that makes me glad from the bottom of my heart. I love each and every one of you. And God bless.